All right, we are live. Hello from the Siena Art Institute. Um, joining us today online is Dr. Lindsay Bakewell. So it's nice to have you joining us. And we'll start to have some viewers with the, the notification going out for this live broadcast. So we'll just wait a few moments um, to let people see the notification to join us for this live stream. Um, as we're waiting for our first viewers to come and join us, I'll just introduce today's event, which is part of the Siena Art Institute's ongoing series of artist talks, Starters Live. This season, we've been focusing on the topic of art and education with a special focus on fostering creative and critical thinking. As always, we welcome our viewers to use the comment section of this broadcast to interact with us so you can feel free to leave questions, which we can try to respond to during this live stream. Um, just to briefly introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Lindsay Bakel is a lecturer in drama at De Montfort University in Leicester in the UK, and she's collaborated in the Siena Art Institute's European projects. Her research focuses on the exploration of key societal issues through applied storytelling and performance. She's currently working on two international research projects that consider how storytelling, drama, and creative practice can teach lifelong educational skills for higher education and employment. And she's currently developing a new strand of research into the experiences of parenting and motherhood through the pandemic. She's published in the area of applied practice on a range of topics, including mental health, education, and environmental issues. So as we have some more viewers who are now joining us for the broadcast, let me first thank you all for joining us today. Again, we welcome you to use the comment section of this broadcast to ask us quest questions, which we can um, be very happy to try and respond to during the second half of our live stream. But for now, I'll turn the microphone over to Lindsay, who can give us a glimpse into some of her recent work. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much for having me today. I am delighted to be able to contribute to um, the Starter Series for April and May on Arts and Education. Um, I've been very lucky to be able to look at some of the other speakers' work, um, and I think there's some really exciting and innovative thinking going on around arts and education. Um, so I would like to try and add some of my own thoughts um, on kind of the conversations that have been happening, particularly obviously around critical thinking and creative thinking as well. Um, and as I was kind of thinking about what I might like to share today, I was reflecting on the work that I have done um, over the last kind of five or six years and kind of the development that's happened within my own work. Um, and I kind of hit upon the fact that a lot of what I do um, uses experiential learning or um, learning through practical engagement with a subject. Um, and I tend to do this through um, storytelling and, and drama. So experiential um, learning and teaching more widely has been adopted by many practitioners and teachers. Um, and we, we do have a, a learning model, um, Kolb's uh, model of experiential learning, that aligns with this. And it clearly identifies the reinforcing nature of practically accessing experiences for learning. And for me, um, combining experiential learning with arts and creativity not only provides young people with the opportunity to access new opportunities um, that can both introduce them to a subject and reinforce their knowledge, but provides the impetus and the tools to reflect upon their learning and to think about its wider applications, which I think is really important as we um, move forward in, in a new digital um, society. So um, as I discuss my, my work today, um, I'd like to just share some of the things that I have, have done and how I've been applying to um, my own research project and then my own teaching, um, which I hope kind of highlights the versatility of experiential learning, um, as well as perhaps putting forward some wide ranging benefits. Um, and I really hope that by sharing this, we can start a, a discussion around experiential learning and think about where it might go in the future. So if you don't mind, um, <laughs> with a background in storytelling and drama, I would like to begin with a story. 
Um, and the story is about my own relationship with experiential learning, which really began, I would say, in around about 2015. I was at Loughborough University completing my PhD in um, restoration, theatre history and spectacular performance, um, something I, I'm still working a little bit, but not kind of the focus of my work. Um, I'd been working on this for, for a couple of years and I, I, I'd been engaging with um, kind of trying to discuss what was happening in the theatre at this time, trying to describe um, what we might see, what we might hear, what we might feel. I had experienced um, kind of practical learning at school and university, so I was trying to get some of these um, plays up on their feet to see what they felt like. Um, being a drama student, that felt quite natural. Um, but I was really kind of hitting a stumbling block when I was coming to the description of what it might feel like to be in the space or what was the kind of complexity of, of the space. And so um, I applied for some, some money um, from, from Loughborough to go and visit the last surviving 17th century theatre in the world, which is in the, the Czech Republic. And this um, this trip was so enlightening in terms of how I started to think about developing my own knowledge and where I could draw knowledge from. So my plan was to um, get to the Czech Republic, visit the theatre, take lots of pictures, write lots of notes down, and then head home and write up a description of what I saw. Now, this particular theatre is inside the castle in Keski Kromlov. So um, if we can have a look at the PowerPoint, the first pictures that I'm going to show you in the PowerPoint are two pictures that were taken um, whilst I was in the theatre. Um, and you will see from these pictures, they are dark. Um, you can make out what's going on, but it's not particularly clear. <laughs> um, and um, they're perhaps not the best things uh, to use in order to describe the space. Um, but that was my plan. I was going to go and I was gonna take these pictures. I was the only visitor at that theatre that day who attempted to take pictures in a space that was kept purposefully dark for presentation. Um, we, they wanted to preserve what was there, 400 years old after all, um, and light sources would have damaged it. I certainly couldn't use a flash on the camera, so I was trying to get as close as possible and go from different angles. And, and the really lovely tour guide, um, who was, it is fair to say, totally confused by what I was trying to do, went to great lengths to explain to me that I could take pictures of the theatre but I couldn't understand the theatre merely by looking at it. She said to me I had to feel it, I had to hear it and I had to live in it. So for the next couple of hours, these were probably some of the best hours that I, I spent doing my, my thesis, I experienced that space and she helped me. I tried out this 400 year old machinery. What you can see um, is a wind machine. So you, you turn the handle and it, it makes the, the sound of the wind. And you can see um, in the other picture, the machinery underneath to help move uh, set pieces, move around. So I trialed this 400 year old machinery. I stood where the performers would have stood and I tested how well my, my voice traveled. I tried pulling the ropes um, to move things like the trapdoors and didn't get very far at all. Um, I felt the weight and the fabric in the costumes. Um, all of these things really reinforced to me how different the theatre was then to how it is now, um, but also the similarities. And so in this moment, I was truly partaking in experiential learning. Now, when I went to the theatre, I intended to have some experiential learning um, by taking pictures. Um, but what I gained by uh, being in the space, touching the space, hearing the space, um, I was able to gain much more than I could possibly have ever gained from reading about somebody else's visit or describing something from a picture. I fully immersed myself in the creation of a theatrical world. 
Um, and the result was that my description of the theatre was, in my opinion, one of the most engaging products of my thesis. And um, because the experience stayed with me and it helped me to shape what needed to be shared. And it also helped me to develop new skills. And these skills have stayed with me and they feed into my own planning as an educator. So um, as Lisa very kindly um, introduced me, I'm now a lecturer in drama at De Montfort University. And I specialize in theater practice, um, applied theater practice and storytelling. And in my teaching, I attempt to provide opportunities for students to move beyond the delivery of myself and, and my fellow lecturers into a space where they can truly explore and examine something for themselves. In June 2019, I was lucky enough to take 14 of my first year drama students to Copenhagen as part of the university's DMU Global Program. Now, this program encourages students to find a classroom outside of their normal university grounds, using cities and towns as a means of learning in a different way. Having found my own experience in the Czech Republic so valuable, I set about planning a program uh, for the trip which really utilised this city as a classroom. Um, as these were drama students, I wanted to build on their learning within the normal university structure um, by offering them an engaging way to develop new skills and knowledge. Now, if you've ever been to Copenhagen or if you haven't, uh, Copenhagen is a beautiful city and it is bursting at the seams with creative activity. We were there for four days. And in that time, the students took part in a comedy workshop, saw, an 18th cent uh, saw 18th century theatre being performed in a theme park of all places. Uh, they visited a number of museums, they went to a film set. Um, and just like I had, they visited a theatre and they played in it. They also took part in a street festival, rather um, impromptu uh, in <laughs> taking part. And we walked pretty much every inch of the city. In the pictures you can see here, they're actually at the film studio and the gentleman is explaining to them uh, how everything works, how they used to record these um, particular pieces of, of TV. Um, and the students following this got to be the actors, got to be the, the people recording, uh, got to look at the footage, got to think about how they might edit that footage and change it. So they were really not just looking, but in, engaging with the space. And while these experiences were in themselves thoroughly enjoyable, um, I think the real benefit to these students were the rich opportunities for learning, which really presented themselves in the moments when we stopped for a picnic or, as you can see here, had waffles um, and ice cream, or even when we were back in the classroom, because the students were able to reflect on the experience they had, but then apply their new knowledge to problems that they had previously found difficult or demonstrate a new problem solving skill um, that they had learned whilst navigating the city and applying it in a different setting. So the engagement with theatre and education outside of the classroom that was kind of engrossed in practical experience had actually given the students some lifelong learning skills, uh, which they were able to call upon and utilize in a, in a range of different settings. Something that when we came back, we noticed that their fellow classmates were not as easily able to do. Now, the skills that they gained um, whilst in Copenhagen have moved beyond their current status as students. Um, these students are, are now about to graduate um, and are applying for and securing um, employment. Um, and this, this learning really uh, supports some work that myself and um, the colleagues at Siena Art Institute have been doing together um, with other colleagues around Europe. We've been working on a project called Certify um, where we have been looking at how engagement with the arts, uh, specifically storytelling, might increase skills in creativity, critical thinking, collaboration and communication. What this project does is it uses experiential learning in a different way to, to what I had done with my students, but in an equally impactful way. 
The purpose of our project is to enable students to use digital storytelling as a means of identifying key competencies and capturing them as a means of sharing them with others. The students have created short digital films that allow employers to better understand the, the learning of the students, um, whilst giving the students an opportunity to learn from their own reflection of their experiences, to consolidate the skills that they have gained and to really promote those. Now, the use of storytelling in this way um, provides an, an, an exchange of experiential learning for both the storyteller and the story listener. So we're encouraging the students that are taking part to go out and have practical experiences and then to be able to, to share them. I'd like to show you here a, um, a video that has, uh, sorry, a digital story that's been created by one of our participants, Ben, um, that really kind of captures the work that has been created within this project. This is Freya, my canine companion. She teaches me many lessons from waking up at sunrise to how to perfect the frisbee throw. But her main lesson is how to ooze every moment. When we eat, we eat. When we sleep, we sleep. When we walk, we run. She shows me that our time together is a gift. It should be sought after and encouraged. Every tug of war, every throw, every stroke. She breathes in perspectives. They are there in front of me, but I choose to ignore. These perspectives encourage me to play and be playful. They unlock creativity, see different points of view, experiment with space and time, and look at what is important from different angles to discover new possibilities, to find new adventures. Okay, so um, I hope you'll agree that Ben's story really does capture the importance of experiential learning. Um, and not only that, but how we can share our experiential learning with others to promote um, our, our skills, our, our learning um, and our, our abilities. Um, now, experiential learning is, oh, sorry, is not just for the benefit of those already in traditional educational structures um, or for the development of uh, formal education skills. So um, with the team at Loughborough, we have been looking at um, formal education uh, through the, the certified project. But when I arrived um, in 2015 to work with the team, uh, Dr. Antonia Liguori um, and the team at Loughborough were looking at experiential learning um, in, a, in a slightly different way. They were working on an Erasmus Plus project. This was my first Erasmus Plus project called DICE, uh, which stood for Digital Innovation and Cultural Heritage Education in Light of 21st Century Learning. So this project sought to understand how storytelling might be used with very, uh, very young students just at the beginning of their educational journey. And it wanted to assess how beneficial it might be um, to use storytelling as a teaching tool for the development of key competencies and aid learning and retention around cultural heritage by active engagement. As part of this project, we were interested in whether or not it was possible to engage children uh, younger than primary school in learning about their own cultural heritage as a means of preparing them for future education. So the project looked very specifically at primary school, but Antonio and I were quite interested in, in what happens prior to primary school. What, what skills can we impart at, at a really young age that use this kind of experiential learning? So um, we planned to do an experiential learning workshop in a museum local to us. We invited children um, aging, uh, ranging in age from one to four with, with their parents um, to visit the museum and to learn about the area in which they lived 
by taking part in a range of practical activities that were suitable for their age, where they could explore objects and stories within the museum. Following this trip, we worked with their parents to create digital stories of their experience. These were designed to act as a lasting reflective reminder and a preservation of the experience. So what I'd like to share with you now um, is a video of my nephew, who is now five, um, who at the age of one was one of our participants um, engaging with the artifacts in the museum. Um, my nephew Noah and I had a really interesting experience when we went to this museum because we actually learned an awful lot about our own history, not just the space that we lived in, but our own personal history. Um, so I'll show you the, the video and then um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it afterwards. Today was Noah's first trip to a museum. He was here to learn about the history of a village in Leicestershire called Barra Ponsor, where his mum and his auntie grew up. As he walked round, Noah soon learnt that he was a really important part of the history of Barrow. Noah learnt that his great, great, great grandma once lived in a house in barrow upon saw and that house was knocked down. And when the house was knocked down, they discovered a dinosaur underneath. This dinosaur is called the Barrow Kipper, and its remains were found in Barrow upon Saw in the 1800s. Here Noah is looking at the model of the Barrow Kipper and learning a little bit more about it. As Noah went further round the museum, he took part in some colouring, he played with some fruit and veg and weighed them up, he had a picture taken with his mummy, and then he saw a sign for Robert Bakewell. We're unsure whether Noah was related to Robert Bakewell, but they have the same surname, so it's very possible. So while Noah was there, he did some reading about him. And before home, Noah sat on the ladybird sofa which is there to celebrate the fact that Loughborough is the home of Ladybird books, books that his mummy used to read when she was little. Noah had a wonderful day learning about his own history and can't wait to return to Loughborough Museum to learn some more. Okay, so um, it was quite a quite a trip for for Noah, myself, and, and my sister, um, getting to grips with kind of the the information that we were receiving. I prior to going did know about the the Barrow Kipper and its kind of place in my own personal history, um, but the information we gained was equally as enlightening for me as I'm sure it will be for Noah as he grows older. So of course when Noah attended he was one so he has no lasting memory of the actual event um, but I do often show him the video of his time in the museum and the day that he helped me do some research um, and I have since taken him for a, a couple of other visits um, and his early experience within the museum has really sparked a curiosity within him to have similar experiences again and to continue his own cultural heritage learning journey by re-engaging through experiential learning with the same space um, and trying to expand his understanding of that knowledge. Um, and so we are <laughs> researching whether we are related to, to Robert Bakewell. Um, and maybe at some point I can update you to let you know whether or not we are. Um, so I would like to then now just move on uh, very quickly to introduce you to a project um, that myself and colleagues across Europe, including uh, Siena Art Institute and Loughborough University are embarking on. It is a new Erasmus Plus project called Creativity. Um, and it looks to address a very pressing issue. Um, and it looks to work with students um, that often are not uh, worked with in terms of their particular age group. So we're looking at how we can use experiential learning as a means of supporting young students between the 12, uh, ages of 12 and 18 to access higher education and future employment. Um, this project comes as a response to the current pandemic that we're, we're all experiencing. 
students of this age have been particularly hard hit in terms of the loss of education and the shifting of exams. Um, and certainly in the UK, and, and it appears to be across uh, Europe as well, um, there has been kind of a, a continued reducing of arts within schools. Um, and so what we're planning to do is the development of um, interactive digital workshops that encourage students to get to engage with the spaces around them. So we're thinking about parks and museums and galleries, whilst gaining the key skills in creativity, collaboration, communication and critical thinking. So in this project, we're going to be combining theatre, storytelling and creative art to offer digitally immersive experiential uh, learning. So this is a new area of experiential learning that is taking place online as a response to our ever changing world. And it's going to be supported by materials that encourage the students to really get out and about, to not just stay at their computer, but to go and try these things. So we hope that through this work we'll be able to empower students to regain the control of their own learning and build and document their own skills in a way that enables them to share um, their, their experiences. Um, and, and this is kind of a, an area that I would I'd like us to kind of to pose as an area of consideration. Um, so the project, the creativity project, is looking at how these students can document their experiential learning for other people to experience their learning too and to better understand it. So I'd like to, to pose whether or not we think um, experiential learning it can not only be useful as a kind of retrospective, reflective experience for those who have the original experience, but if through capturing it um, with uh, theatre, storytelling and, and creative arts, we can actually make it a benefit to those who are the listener or the viewer. Um, to kind of support my, my thinking in this area, I just wanted to show you, um, to share with Today you... Today was Noah's first to share with you a few things that we've done at Loughborough that kind of support this kind of thinking. So since 2015, um, myself and the team at Loughborough, this is when we were kind of set up, have applied this method to um, environmental issues such as water shortage and self-sufficiency, societal challenges such as um, seeking asylum and dangerous living conditions and also educational disadvantage such as adult education. Um, what I'm showing you here are some pictures from a project called Leader that we did. Uh, so this was loneliness in the digital age. And we asked participants to engage in scrapbooking and creating um, materials that could share their experiences as carers. And what we have here is um, a, a book, um, a box, sorry, that... Um, is designed so they, they got to imagine these things uh, without being able to make them. We didn't need to make them, they just had to imagine them. They made a box that helped them to share their emotions. When they were feeling tired or stressed, they were able to pass them on to other people. And through the scrapbooking, they were able to describe some of those experiences in the hope that other people might start to have a little bit more um, consideration to what it was would be like to be um, a, a carer. We also um, worked with so the the picture that you can see um, with the, the lots of like colourful um, hexagons and the the writing in the pictures was a project that we did with asylum seekers um, and refugees and they were talking about their experiences around how they don't feel like they are socially included, um, how they perhaps came to the country as doctors and are now not able to access any form of education or employment. And through music, through drawings, through um, written text, they were sharing their experiences of the journey to the UK, the, the experiences that they'd had with people within the UK and what their hopes were for the future. And then the top one uh, called The, the Reasons uh, was a project that we did around um, conflict resolution, two different sides of the same argument um, and previously not being able to have a way of uh, talking to each other, to, to sharing their own experiences and their own perspectives, but through storytelling and visual art um, were able to work through some of the challenges that they had um, and to see things from, from the other side. And so um, I'd, I'd like to suggest that 
all of these projects really support this idea that if we can adopt experiential learning through theatre storytelling and visual art, that actually we might be able to move beyond uh, the learning of an individual to perhaps the learning of a wider community and to really um, create concrete examples of understanding and learning um, that really benefit wider society. Um, and that this might then help us to experience another, be able to ex um, assess somebody else's needs, or perhaps to continue the educational chain from one student to another. Thank you very much. Um, I would love to answer any questions that you might have. Thank oh, you. Yes. Thank you so much. It was super inspiring to have this glimpse into some of the, the many projects that you're involved with and um, to have a look at some examples of also the work of connected to these projects from mm -hmm. things as complex as a 400 year old theater to <laughs> as simple as a walk with a dog, but that can still um, offer very rich opportunities for experiential learning. Yeah. And um, we have had a, a lot of really positive comments um, coming in as well as a, a few questions. Um, for example, our um, our director, um, Miriam, was saying, this is so great. I was wondering if these ideas here in reference to the mm -hmm. cultural heritage museums, if the ideas have been taken up by local schools, maybe as a follow up with slightly older children to engage them creatively and constructively with their heritage. Mm -hmm. Maybe the question is simply if Loughborough University works directly with schools so that the research is implemented in longer term, for example. Um, so um, at, at Loughborough and De Montfort, we haven't uh, picked it up with uh, local schools, but um, the um, it was a university in Rome, actually, um, that was leading the project and they did take it into to schools um, and they have subsequently gone on to work with, with older children. Um, what we have found to be really great and really inspiring though is that um, both myself and uh, De Montfort and Antonio at Loughborough, um, when we have done these projects and we've learned things, we have then kind of shared them with our own students. At De Montfort we have um, modules that encourage them to go out into schools and to, to do work with them. They do kind of a work experience, um, I suppose. And we have seen storytelling happening within these schools. We have seen digital stories pop up. We have seen them kind of adopt this idea of experiential learning and taking the students outside of the classroom. So um, yeah, I think it's, it, it, is, it is obviously passing on. And um, I think that our upcoming creativity project will also allow us to, to do some of that as well, which will be really nice. Oh, that's great. It's, you know, certainly an approach that I think, um, well, connects to what we um, work with here at the Siena Art Institute in terms of both um, projects for engagement with the local community, as well as um, our study abroad students who may come for a semester where the idea of experiential learning is really at the heart of why people <laughs> seek out these opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. But I think also in the region of cultural heritage museums, and particularly the idea of sharing learning with a larger, a wider um, community is really quite meaningful mm -hmm. as well. Uh, in terms of um, museum activities with children, there was a question that came in from one of our um, local viewers, uh, our um, silversmithing instructor, Lauda, who's asking in terms of museum activities, it may be um, important to do them in a way that the young children um, can experiment with a few images, a few sounds, a few tactile mm -hmm. experiences, but um, kind of carefully selected. I think with the idea mm -hmm. of perhaps it may be a little overly stimulating to have too much mm -hmm. input all at the same time. Absolutely, and I think then that does, uh, like we, we see with Noah, um, and being able to take him back and adding to that experience, giving him something else to experience, to, to play with or to try that builds on the previous experience um, in, a, in a kind of reinforcing but also new information kind of way um, is, is really beneficial for him. So yeah, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Yes, even something as simple as, well, the example of taking a walk with the dog, it doesn't need to be some massive um, uh, theatrical experience or that that can also yeah. be meaningful, but sometimes yeah. even simple moments can really be 
um, very meaningful as well. Um, there was a, just a follow-up from your comments about the creativity work from uh, our director Miriam, who was saying uh, that you know, in terms of sharing the work with your students, it sounds fantastic. So hopefully, the students will be the ambassadors who will implement the results of the research. Yeah, that's certainly what we we aim to do. We um, we like to think of it as kind of training trainers. So. Um, mm -hmm. We, you know we open the door and then we let them kind of run with it and every single time when I work with students they come back with ideas that are beyond anything that I could have thought of my myself and their creativity and their kind of engagement is is incredible and it's it's really exciting to see that because um it just means that we're we're progressing further and further and further and there's more and more stuff in this area so yeah it's really good Oh, it's wonderful to hear about. And um, well, I, probably in the interest of time, we should conclude our discussion for the day, although I would love to keep going. It's really fascinating to hear about your work. But thank you so much for sharing a glimpse into your recent projects with us. And um, I also thank our, our viewers for joining us today. Um, I'll just mention to our viewers, if you don't already, please make sure to follow the Siena Art Institute on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date for our upcoming activities. Although um, today's broadcast concludes our series of Tuesday talks about art and education for this season, we still have other events coming up. For example, on Friday, June 4th at 6 p.m., our online events will be continuing with a poetry reading and conversation with Mairead Byrne and Will Schutt, who's or who are organizers of Polychromia, the Siena Art Institute's annual international festival of poetry and translation. And they'll be joined by the award-winning poets, John Murillo and Durso Villa. Uh, so they'll be talking about the purpose and practice of writing poetry today. So we hope you can all be back here, this same place on Friday, June 4th for our broadcast with those poets. Uh, but again, thank you so much, Lindsay. It was a real pleasure thank talking you. with you today. Thank you for having me. It was great. Thank you. All right, well, take care. Bye. Bye.